Christ is risen. So since last April, the end of April 2023, I have preached 123 times. I've written 68 different sermons, mainly Sundays, but including Wednesdays, holidays, weddings, funerals. How many of those sermons do you remember? Now, seriously, it's just not humanly possible, is it? As much information as gets shared just on a Sunday morning in a 25, 30 minute sermon, we can't retain all that information over the course of any given year. But my hope and my prayer is that there have been at least a good number of specific things that have stuck with you. Pieces of God's Word and truths that we hear time and time again that God gives to us that stick with us, that maybe encourage us to change our lives or change our behaviors. Ways that God uses these sermons to help us in this journey we're on with Jesus. Now, this morning, as I mentioned, we're thinking about worship. We're thinking about the importance of worship when it comes to this journey with Jesus that we are on. But if you can't remember any particular sermon that I may have preached last week, over the last few weeks, why bother? I mean, what's the point? Why worship? Why keep coming together doing what we do over and over and over again? That's where I want to start this morning. I want you to think about that. Why worship? Take a moment, think about that. As always, if you're comfortable having some conversation with the people you're sitting around, talk a little bit, brainstorm a little bit. Think about why it is that we're here. Why are we doing what we're doing? All right, so what are we doing here? And just for the sake of time, if you could give me some responses uh, somewhat succinctly, I would appreciate that. So what do you think? Why are we here? Mike? So no offense taken, but it's not about the sermon. Okay, it's about a community of believers coming together to hallow God's name. Good? Leslie? Okay, we may not remember what we ate last month, but like the meals that we eat regularly, this feeds our soul, our spirit, as food feeds our body. Good? Rick? All right, the Word, which is the real Word, and the sacrament, which is the real deal, are what give us Christ. Good. Ron. Okay, God commanded it. All right, that's not a bad reason. God commanded, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Jerry. Good. Yeah, we are in a, our society, our culture today, we are bombarded by so much sensory experiences and so much, and so we need to repeat some of the basics. Praying the Lord's Prayer together, speaking the creeds together, those things that will stay in our minds long after many things won't. So formational 
and purpose. Okay, what else do we hear? Paul. Good. Yeah, so we also refer to this as the divine service. It is God's service. God serving us in a whole variety of ways that we could name. And then we respond. So God coming to us and us responding to Him. Good? Gene. Okay, so you may not retain every nugget of truth and beautiful things that I share with you. But in a general way, they'll continue, again, drawn from God's Word, continue to shape us, form us, instruct us in the lives that we lead. Good? Jim? Say it one more time. Thank you. To glorify the Lord. Yeah, to worship, to give thanks to God, to acknowledge Him for the God He is. Excellent. Barbara, one more. Hmm. Yeah, anybody not have a busy life? I mean, even in retirement, I hear, you know, you retired people are busier than all of us who have vocations, supposedly. But as busy as our lives are, and we acknowledge it, they are, we're on the run constantly, we need to stop. And this provides an opportunity for us to do that, to stop, to pause, to receive. So thank you for that. And there's more. I mean, we could... We could keep going with that. I know it. But the reasons that we worship, as you started us out, Mike, I'll come back to that, because that's true. That what we do here, week in and week out, it's not just about the sermon. This is not just about the music. What is this about? Broken record, right? What is this about? Tell me. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. We heard it again today from Peter's sermon. First reading from Acts chapter 4. What's Peter preaching? He laid it out crystal clear. In chapter 4, verse 12, speaking of Jesus, he said, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And how is that saving accomplished? How is that salvation accomplished? The scriptures are filled that speak to that. The New Testament in particular, but not just the New that we hear over and over again how we are saved, how salvation does come to us. But it's there in the Old Testament as well. From the beginning of the Psalms to the prophets, over and over again, it pointed us to Jesus. I mean, we heard it in each one of our three readings for today. That we very likely do every single week because God's Word is filled with that message of how it happens, of God's love for us. Listen to this. Uh, also, from our first reading, Peter's sermon a couple verses earlier in verse 10. He said, By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. From our second reading, from 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And then from John 10, that beautiful 
chapter of Jesus speaking of himself as a shepherd, us as the sheep, he says it over and over again throughout that chapter, and I'm just pulling out a couple of verses from our reading today, a portion of that, where Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again, death and resurrection. No one takes it from me, Jesus said, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. In other words, what happened back in 33 AD, that was no accident. That was no unfortunate set of circumstances. No. That was the plan. Jesus knew why he had come. To lay down his life and to take it up again by his authority, by his power, out of his love for us. Now, one of the more challenging things that comes with worship, especially since we do it week after week after week, and we hear these similar words over and over again, that it can be very easy for us to fall into this mode or mindset of, yeah, 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 yeah. Heard this before. Isn't there anything new? Can't you say it another way? Isn't there something different? Doesn't everybody know this already? Why do we have to hear it again? Well, you see, the reality is, it is exactly this, in all of its simplicity, that makes everything, and I mean absolutely everything, possible. It's all about Jesus. And not just the example that Jesus gives us for how to live our life. Now, don't get me wrong, that's in here. And that's a part of what Jesus lays out for us and important for us to take to heart. But that's secondary. The example he gives for us, to us about how to live life is secondary. The primary message that Jesus came to bring is what we heard over and over again. It's about Jesus laying down his life, his death on the cross, not by accident, but with great intentionality and by his authority. Laying down his life, being the sacrifice for our sin, to bring forgiveness and taking it up again. His resurrection to new life, that victory over sin, death, and the devil. And that's what gives us everything we need. Now the irony that comes in with regard to the complacency that we can sometimes feel, the we've heard all that before, and how easily it can be for us, humanly speaking, to take for granted this amazing good news and this message of the gospel of Jesus Christ the irony is, that's exactly where the devil wants us to go. He wants us to get bored with it. He wants us to tire of it. So we come back to what worship is all about. It's all about Jesus. It's about the touch and the impact that Jesus has on our lives. It's about the difference that Jesus can and does make in the day-to-day -day 
that you and I live. It's about knowing who we are. All because of Jesus. Now week after week, we hear from God and His Word as God expresses these many truths to us in so many different and beautiful ways. For example, today's Gospel reading. Good Shepherd Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Easter. John chapter 10 is a chapter filled with Jesus using this metaphor, describing himself as the shepherd, the good shepherd, and us as a sheep. We heard a portion of that, and there's so much more. How he beautifully expresses so many of these truths that he desires for us to know and for us to take to heart. I want to give us an opportunity, one more this morning, to to pause and think a little bit about this, to put some uh, flesh on the bones of this idea, this imagery of Jesus as our Good Shepherd, and how, how does that imagery bring home the promises of the good news of the gospel of Jesus. So I want you to think about, and again, if you're comfortable having some conversation, go ahead and talk with each other. But how does this imagery of Jesus as our good shepherd, us as sheep, how can that make a difference in our lives today? Take a moment, please. All right, so what are some things that come to mind? Again, for the sake of time, if you could be somewhat brief, succinct in your remarks, but how does our understanding of this, which is honestly for us a bit outmoded, outdated, an example, and yet I think we can tie in enough to make sense of it for our lives even today. What difference does Jesus as our good shepherd make for us? Eva? Okay, from time to time, you need to get the hook, the crook, pull you back in. All right, Debbie? Gives us hope. Good. What else has our good shepherd? Kim? Protection. Yeah, big part of the shepherd's job was to protect the sheep. His care, his protection for us. What else do we have? Colton, what you got? Nothing? All right, just checking. What do we have? Ron? Gives us peace. What else? Jim? Yeah, What what I read over and over again, it's expressed over and over by Jesus As our good shepherd, he lays down his life for the sheep. Powerful. What else? This imagery, what does it bring? Greg? Okay, in the midst of a crazy, complicated, challenging world, we know we can go to him, that he is going to be here for us, as a shepherd always is for his sheep. A hired hand runs off, as Jesus shared, by way of that example. But the shepherd never leaves. He is always here. Good. And that presence, yeah, that presence that we can count on, that we know. What else? Bill. Good. He leads us by word and example. What is his word? The word of truth. It's a promise promise after promise that we can take to heart. And he has laid out, again, as I said, even secondarily, what does our life look like as his sheep for the purpose of sharing that good news with others by the example we lead, by the words we use, by the attitude we carry on and on. It reflects back to the shepherd. It's about the kingdom. Good. Joe? Excellent, thank you. And now I can't repeat half of what you said. 
with that. But no, it's not only some aspects, I'll kind of work my way backward through that, but it's the shepherd knows my name. And what does that communicate? I mean, the value among hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, he knows your name, my name. He knows us intimately and well. And not only does this imagery of how Jesus speaks in terms of the Good Shepherd speak of himself and who he is, it also speaks to us, doesn't it? Of who we are as sheep. And as Joe shared, sheep are a challenge, uh, maybe to say it most simply. Uh, And again, not that we, most of us, have experience, but as we've studied it, learned it, read it, heard it, sheep can be kind of dumb sometimes. Sheep stray. Sheep walk away. Sheep can be very stubborn. Sheep, we, are not perfect. We are not self-sufficient. That we don't have it all together. We haven't got all this figured out. We need a shepherd. We need the good shepherd. And that's in part what worship affords us. The reminder that we need of our brokenness, of our sin, of our need for Jesus. To be reminded that we're in this together. We're not on our own. We're not off by ourselves. But we are in this together. And in that regard, worship is very formative. It shapes us. It molds us. That's a big part of why we want to have kids here in worship. Why we have chosen not to do something like children's church or education hour during worship. We need the kids. And the kids need us. There's something very beautiful about worship. And also something rather mysterious, if we're honest about this. But when it comes to children, we want the kids here. It reminds the children and us that this is not about me but we're a part of something much bigger, much more beautiful, that God has put together here. And in our very self-directed, self-centered way of approaching life, and that's our human nature, we step into, as my wife has shared time and again, we step into a we space. And out of me, but into we, to know that again, the Lord is here in our midst. Those children that are here, they need to see the other kids that are here too. They need to see the teenagers. They need to see the other families. They need to see the older adults. That they're all a part of this. An important part of this as well. It is shaping and forming of so much in our hearts and so much in our lives. Now, are the kids going to take in every word of the sermon? Do you? (laughs) But they're listening, and so are you. And that's in part why in most of my sermons we've got talk time. We have time to think about what this Word of God means for us. For families, giving the opportunity to talk, to engage the kids, to hear from the kids, to let them hear from the adults. 
to offer their answers, their responses. We're engaged. We are in this together. And as, and I forget who it was that mentioned it, but part of the formative, the molding, the shaping that God does in worship is that we do pray the Lord's Prayer together. That we speak the words of the creeds, our ancient statements of faith, the Apostles, the Nicene, the Athanasian. These words that followers of Jesus have been confessing together, speaking together, essentially the very same words for almost 2,000 years. In good times, in bad times, in times of persecution, speaking very clearly against heresy and errors and what's wrong to lay clear time and again from God and His Word who He is and what He has done for us. And some of the mystery as we gather together at the table celebrating the Lord's Supper most every Sunday and the mystery of Hebrews 12, that we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. It's not even just us who are here, but we're in the presence of God Almighty who has made Himself known and is here in our midst, as well as angels, an archangel, all the company of heaven, those gone before us. How does that work? I have no idea. But that's a part of the wonder and the mystery of gathering together in worship. It's a gift that God has given to us. It shapes us, molds us into not necessarily what we want to be, but shaping us and forming us into who God wants us to be. Shaping us not in the world's lies, and deceptions. Speaking of how many voices, how much information we're bombarded with, there are so many lies and so much deception that try to shape us. But gathering here week in and week out, gathering in the truth of God and His Word shapes us in a very different way. The truth of who we've been created by the truth that we can live without fear. The truth that we do have hope. And all because of Jesus. If you want some actual studies about this and how, how worshiping together, doing what we do, actually has real live measurable benefits, there are studies out there. I may share in tomorrow's update from Harvard, mental, physical benefits of this. They're real. It's how God designed it. Do we have to be here? No. Don't have to be here. But why wouldn't we? We know God is here. We know the gifts that come. And as with all of these marks of discipleship that we're stepping through here in this season of Easter, thinking about our journey with Jesus, none of this is intended to be guilt. None of it's arm twisting. None of it's brow beating someone into coercing us into a particular kind of behavior. But it's about remembering who we are and whose we are the gift God has given to us, the privilege we have here in these times and days and this country of ours to be able to gather for worship and to be able to do it. It's about the love of our Savior who's come to give us life, life that he speaks about in John 10, in this chapter right before our reading for today. The love that he's given to us that offers abundant life, a full life, a life that we can live truly without shame, without guilt, without fear. 
no matter where our lives have taken us. So friends, know His forgiveness, His love, and the life He offers to us, they're real. They're gifts that we can celebrate every day and every week as we gather together to worship Him. Now the what now for today, if you want to grab your Bring It Home insert, it's also up on the screen. Uh, two bullets for us today. First, as you come to worship in the weeks ahead, come with your heart and mind open for God to continually transform you. And second, I invite you to ask the question, who can you invite to join you for worship? To be a part of this journey with Jesus. So on this journey we're on, let's continue. Let's continue to worship, to celebrate together, sharing, expressing, and experiencing the good news of Easter and the good news of Jesus, week in and week out. Because Christ is risen. Amen.